Hey crew, it's Pitt, and I'm back with another Bible study. Today is one of those days. If you are unfamiliar with what I am doing here, I it is highly, highly recommended that you begin at the beginning. There's a whole playlist devoted to what I am doing and how I hold some slightly unconventional beliefs, and that if you are unaware of the things that I am doing, that you might get your toes stepped on as we go along. And while it is not intentional, I do not apologize for it. I am doing merely what I am told here, and so we are going to dive into the birth of Jesus Christ. We left off with the I Am, and we left off with John the Baptist being prophesied. Now we're going to deal with the birth of Jesus. It's only dealt with in two of the four Gospels, and so we are only going to be dealing with two of the four Gospels today, and neither one of them is the source Gospel or the, the excessive gospel. So we're going to dig into Matthew first, and we're going to look at the genealogy of Jesus. If you get easily bored, I wouldn't mind if you put it on time and a half, because this is going to take a second. This is the record of, gene of the genealogy <clears throat> of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Amminadab. Amminadab, the father of Nashon, and Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David the king. David was the father of Solomon by Uriah's wife and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asa. Asa was the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah. Uzziah was the father of Jotham, and Jotham was the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was the father of Manasseh, Manasseh the father of Ammon. Ammon the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of the exile in Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shelatiel, Shelatiel the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, Abiud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor. Azor was the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim and to Chem the father of Eliud. Eliud was the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Mathan. Mathan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. In all then there were fourteen generations from Abraham to David, fourteen from David to the exile of Babylon, and fourteen from the exile to the Christ. And here we have a first problem. You know what the problem is? I bet you don't, but it's a, ba it's a major one. We are about to get into the virgin conception and birth of the child, and therefore he is not David's descendant. Right? Now, it can be traced through the line of the mother, and Jewishness passes through the mother, but the father's line is the patriarchy. And if Joseph is not the literal father of the child, then it is not the line of David. Now, you can make all kinds of arguments about divinely made it David, but are we talking about artificial insemination? Did he take a sample from Joseph and place it in Mary to make sure that it was the correct one? Or did he just spontaneously combust it in there? Like, Omni Domni, you have a baby. Because the story we are given is, Omni Domni, you have a baby. I believe there's more of the artificial insemination. We'll get to that here in just a minute. But according to the story, God said B, and there was a baby in there. You can make the argument that he just magically made it of David's line, but that's just not its just not how genealogy works. And so this entire genealogy right here is for jo Joseph, the husband of Mary, who is not the father of Christ. And so there's no point to have this here other than because you're forming a religion. And that's what is happening. They are absolutely forming a religion. That's why they included the genealogy. So people would lend 
credence to it, but you cannot simultaneously say that he was not born from this dude and that he was born from this dude. It's a contradiction. It's one of the many that we have pointed out going along, and it won't be the last that we will point out going along, but it is an important one to point out right here and right now as we get into this. And if that offended you, you're not going to like the rest of this. So, And this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged in marriage to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and unwilling to disgrace her publicly, he resolved to divorce her quietly. But after he had pondered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to embrace Mary as your wife, for the one conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, Behold, the virgin will be with child, and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke up, he did it. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he embraced Mary as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Okay. So, we got a problem. Again, oh, we're going to set aside the genealogy thing, right? And this is the confirmation that, that this was not from him. It is not his child, and so it is not of his line. But after he had pondered these things, an angel appears to him and says, Joseph, do not be afraid, so that this prophecy may be fulfilled. And that's the problem. Now, if you've been along, if you have been tagging along from the beginning, like I told you, there's a reason why we went through Isaiah. And it was for this. And so we're going to go back to Isaiah. But we're not going to have to read the whole thing because we know what the context is already. We're just reviewing now. So, let's read the context of the sign of Emmanuel and see what, what it actually meant. And again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask for a sign from the Lord your God, whether from the depths of Sheol or the heights of heaven. But Ahaz replied, I will not ask. I will not test the Lord. And then Isaiah said, Hear now, O house of David, is it not enough to try the patience of men? Will you try the patience of my God as well? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And by the time he knows enough to reject evil and choose good, he will be eating curds and honey. For before the boy knows enough to reject evil and choose good, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid to waste. Now, when we went through Isaiah, we did a word study. And that word study was on this virgin right here and there we discovered that this word does not necessarily mean virgin as a matter of fact it almost always means maiden and maiden is just a young woman it is not necessarily a virgin but it normally is but it's not necessarily a virgin and beyond that we have the fulfillment of this prophecy we have already seen Isaiah wed a young woman bed her, have a child who wasn't named Emmanuel, but was considered the, the fulfillment of the prophecy in real time, prophet time, for this, this in particular. By the time he was eating curds and honey, he knew enough to reject good and evil. And before the good boy was enough to reject good, evil and choose good, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid to waste. That part was fulfilled. It wasn't by Jesus. That part was not fulfilled by Jesus. Now, they want you to think that because Mary had a virgin birth, that that meant that. But that's not even what this prophecy is saying. 
this prophecy is Isaiah talking about, I'm going to marry this chick, have a baby, and that by the time that baby is old enough to reject evil and choose good, these two kings will be dead, and it happened. That's important, right? It's important to know that this has been fulfilled. Now, I want to make it clear. It is entirely possible that there is multiple fulfillments to prophecy, but it doesn't specify that anywhere in this book. It does not. It does not say that it will be fulfilled here and there. When they are talking about the end times, they are extremely clear about that, and we went through this in excruciating detail for that. So much so that people don't pay attention. People don't go back to the beginning. But I did. I went through this in excruciating detail, and we talked about timing and what the fulfillment actually meant. And if you were interested in that, I highly suggest you go back and start at the beginning. You'll get to that, to us, uh, eventually. So, what's next? Next, we are going to jump over into Matthew. Oh, wait, that's the wrong one. We're jumping into Luke. And this is where Gabriel foretells Jesus' birth, right? We read through this in the last one, but we're going to read through this part again, and then we're going to jump into two. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to a, <clears throat> to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin, maiden, pledged in marriage to a man named Joseph, who was of the house David, and the virgin's name was Mary. The angel appeared to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. So the angel told her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. And he will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will never end. How can this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? And the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Look, even Elizabeth, your relative, has conceived a son in her old age, and she who was called barren is in her sixth month, for no word of God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it happen to me according to your word. And now might be a good time. Oh, I didn't pop it out before, but if you're unaware, this word, Isis or Yeshua, is the same as Joshua. Joshua and Jesus is the same word. Yeshua and Yahshua are the same. Just in case you were, were curious and unaware because you have not been here since the beginning when we did the word study on this back in Joshua, oh. Uh, this is the same name, right? It's the same word. Oh. And so they get in here into the virginity thing. And here's something to pay attention to, right? We have Matthew and we have Luke both talking about the virgin birth. But we do not have Mark. And Mark is the source. According to scholarly pursuits, right? Not according to church traditions, but according to the scholarly research we have, it appears that Mark is the origination of the Gospels and that Matthew was Mark plus extra stuff and Luke was uh, Mark plus extra different stuff. And like slightly different focuses because they were going to different target markets. We talked about that yesterday. But the one that is missing the virgin birth is Mark. Right? Mark and John. And John's a whole separate thing because John's a little bit <laughs> extremist, right? John is a little bit zealot. And so these other three are fairly dispassionate, not even close, but uh, compared to John, absolutely. But like <clears throat> somewhat historical recordings. And so it's important to note that the source material for both Matthew and Luke scientifically appears to be Mark, and Mark does not record a, a, a virgin birth. So, 
Take from that what you will. The part that interests me is, if you have been following along, we're going to get into conspiratorial land here because I have a slightly different viewpoint on how things went down in history, and I believe that there was an entity involved. Now, whether that entity is an angel or whether that entity is an alien is a matter of definition. To me, it doesn't really matter. It is something other than us that is interfering, sometimes through genetic manipulation. And so, this part here, oh, oh wait, we ain't got there yet. Here we go, right here. Okay. <laughs> the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Let's look at that. Let's take it to the Greek. And that's where it began, right? So, the angel replied, the Holy Spirit, right? What's the Holy Spirit? Well, Hagion, set apart by God. Holy or sacred? So, holy is a pretty fair spirit. Is the wind, breath, or spirit? Oh, wait. Wind, breath, or spirit? Where have we talked about the breath and the spirit before? Well, that is the spirit of creation for us, right? I believe that's a real thing. Will come upon you and the power that is separate from the spirit, that is separate from the creative force, and the power of of the Most High, or the power, especially a miraculous power, highest, most high, the heights, something from the heavens. Does it have to be God sitting on a throne? No. Does it have to be an angel floating on wings? No. It can be a spaceship. Doesn't mean that it has to be, right? We are exploring possibilities here. And I do believe that there is an entity involved. I don't know why it flies around, but it's mysterious, and they describe it as wheels within wheels and things like that. So it's a little bit different than what we see normally. And it's generally passing overhead. So I lean into the, if there was a virgin birth, it was probably an artificial insemination type of situation. There was a power or a dynamo from on high that envelops will overshadow, envelops to cast shade upon on, to envelop in a haze of brilliancy. That's an interesting interpretation. You, Mary, and so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, the Holy One is set apart from, that can be just like Isaiah was and just like Solomon was, set apart as a Nazarene. Or it could be your divine. I lean towards one more than the other, and I bet you can guess which one it is. <clears throat> the Son of God here does not necessarily speak of an incarnation of the divine, because they were not really looking for that. We talked about that, and we will again. And so now we're going to jump down into two, because we're getting back to the birth of Jesus. We dealt with oh, John the Baptist yesterday, so, and we will again. But now... In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census would be taken for the whole empire. This was the first census to take place while Quir Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph went up from Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David, called Bethlehem. And since he was from the house and line of David, he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to him in marriage, and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her child to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. And she wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in the manger, because there was no room for them in the end. And while that is a very sympathetic story that we have all heard, censuses are not uncommon, right? I take exception to something in this, though, because I spend an awful lot of time talking about David and it turns out that David's city is Jerusalem not Bethlehem and you can make small distinction because it's here and here but you know why Jerusalem is David's city it's because Jerusalem did not belong to Israel until after David as a matter of fact David was born down here in the region of Hebron and he reigned and 
was a bit of a vagabond and a thug and a strong arm mafioso type person who plagued this area down here south of Hebron up until the point where he was raised a king and then went forth and conquered Jerusalem and its environs, right? So the city of Bethlehem and Bayada and Daisha and all of this right here, he captured this area after he was made king. And so Bethlehem is not the city of David. The city of David is identified quite clearly as Jerusalem because he took it. But if you were looking for the origins of him, it is somewhere around the area south of Hebron. Hebron's an important point, I believe, for a variety of reasons. It's, it's a focal point for a lot of things. David was here. David was also a little bit set apart, right? Do y'all remember how set apart David was? He was a ruddy boy, right? And so was Moses. They both shared commonalities that set them apart in physical appearance to the point of recognition. That's important to remember, too. And so I do have a problem here where it says they went to the city of David called Bethlehem. That's not, right? The city of Bethlehem was not the city of David. Jerusalem was by conquest, but there was a place south of Hebron, right? It's pretty close to Hebron, but it wasn't in Hebron from what I could determine. We spent a lot of time there when we were back in Kings. And there were shepherds residing in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And just then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the city of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a great multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. And then the angels had left them and gone into heaven. The shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And so they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And after they had seen the child, they spread the message that they had received about him. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, which was just as the angel had told them. Okay. This is a little bit weird. Right? Not that the angels would appear... It is a little bit strange that they would appear to the shepherds, right? Now, you can make the argument the shepherd of mankind, okay, whatever. They're, they're irrelevant, right? In the, in the grand scope, the grand scheme, if you're bringing the Messiah, then it should be to the priest, right? The announcement should come to the priest. One of the Levitical orders, there has bound to be at least one that somewhat follows. But you don't. You bring it to these random guys out in the wilderness who have a vision, right? They all share a vision, and that is, okay, I'm, I am perfectly willing to accept that. And they go and they find this random child in the manger, and it's still there in the time that it takes them to get there. Okay. And then they go out, and they're telling everybody about this. Okay. And Mary knows, and she stores all this up. Okay. We'll come back to the presentation at the temple because that's a little bit farther down the line than where we need to go next. But Luke doesn't deal with prophecy here, right? We're not talking about this was fulfilled in Isaiah. We're not talking about that kind of stuff right here, right? He, he does quote Matthew, Right, or it's referenced back to Matthew, but we're not really dealing with prophecy out there at all. 
This is the angels went in real time to these shepherds. Take my word for it, bro. I know that's going to hurt some people's feelings, but that is what we're doing, and I'm willing to accept that. I am willing to accept that angels really did appear and that they really went and said that this child is here. But I just really feel like maybe there would have been a whole lot more fuss made about that baby. Like a whole lot more fuss. And we're going to get to the Egypt. Don't worry, that's coming. We, I would think that there would be a whole lot more fuss made about that child. Like these shepherds are out there and they're like, okay, these angels appear to us. And a great multitude of the host of heaven. Come on now. Bro. And so they go at the behest of this angel, and they're like, hey, go to this specific manger, which is where they feed animals, like it's like a sheltered place for animals to sleep. And they, they put food in there, and that's where they put the food is the manger. The baby's laying in the manger. And so they go, and it just happens that there's this baby in there. And first off, there is a 0% chance that these guys are not now disciples of Jesus starting today. Right? They are there with that kid forever. Like, how do you hear from the angels that the child is the son of God and he is born and then you go back to just, you know, shepherding? That's a little bit tough, right? Unless you're just trying to sell a religion. And it's just a confirmation that you just put in there. Okay. Back to Matthew. Okay. And after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the time of Herod, Magi arrived, <clears throat> Magi from the east, arrived in Jerusalem, asking, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east, and have come to worship him. And when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had assembled all the chiefs, priests and scribes of the people. He asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people. And then Herod called the Magi secretly and learned from them the exact time the star had appeared. And sending them to Bethlehem, he said, Go, and search carefully for the child, and when you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. And after they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stood over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with great delight. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they fell down and worshipped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they withdrew to the country, to their country, by another route. <clears throat> okay, so Jesus was born in Bethlehem during the time of King Herod. And Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem. Now, who are the Magi? Fortunately for us, we just had a study on that, right? We just talked about this and how this is the remnants of the Babylonians, right? They have long been shattered from Babylon, and we are now into the third part of the media, the Mede Persians' uh, rule, the dom domination of uh, who is this? This was the Sasanians, yeah, I think it's the Sasanians, and so. That's who this is. This is the learned wise men of Babylon of whom Daniel was the chief, right? He was the, the chief magician. And so uh, that's who's coming. They see a star, they follow it. Now, the Herod, Herod called the Magi secretly and learned from them the exact time that the star had appeared, right, right before that. He assembled all the chief priests and scribes and asked them where the Christ was to be born. And they say in Bethlehem in Judea because of this in Micah. So let's read it. What does this say? Now, O daughter of troops, mobilize your troops for a siege is laid against us. With a rod, they will strike the cheek of the judge of Israel. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, 
who are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come forth for me, one to be a ruler over Israel, one whose origins are of old, from the days of eternity. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers will return to the children of Israel. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majestic name of the Lord as God, and they will dwell securely. And then his greatness will extend to the ends of the earth, and he will be our peace when Assyria invades our land and tramples our citadels. We will raise against it seven shepherds, even eight leaders of men, and they will rule the land of Assyria with the sword, and the land of Nimrod with the blade drawn, so he will deliver us when Assyria invades our land and marches into our borders. What does that have to do with this? That has absolutely nothing to do with Jesus. It doesn't. This has to do with real-time events that are happening real-time in the time of Micah. And is fulfilled. Now, you can make the argument for the dual fulfillment. Okay, patterns repeat. Okay, whatever. But it's not what they're looking for. Right? What are they promised here? He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord in the majestic name of the Lord. <clears throat> well, that's not what happened. And they will dwell securely. Definitely did not happen. And then his greatness will extend to the ends of the earth. You can make the argument that Christianity extending, but it's not really at the ends of the earth. Right? It's, a, it's available in Asia, but it's not the dominant right it's available in places but it's not the dominant so it's not to the ends of the earth he did not come in person to to do now you can make the argument that this is talking about a messiah to come who will do these things but he hasn't he did not like he was not our peace when assyria invaded the land and trampled the citadels now this this is separate and they will rule the land of Assyria with the sword and the land of Nimrod with the blade drawn. Well, that hasn't happened either. And so, like, these things are not fulfilled by Jesus in real time. Jesus time. They are dealing with real time prophet time. And just like today, where people will go and pull things out of context in order to confuse and obfuscate, right? People are int intentionally trying to confuse you with news and politics and all the things. The same thing happened then. People haven't changed. People are the same. And these people, these people were forming a religion. And that hurts people's feelings to hear, but that doesn't make it not true, right? So this doesn't mean anything. This means nothing. This does not promise that the Messiah is coming from Bethlehem. That's not what Micah says. And so he calls them secretly and learned them from the exact time the star had appeared, right? This flight to Egypt, let's go ahead and do the flight to Egypt. When the Magi had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. And so he got up and took the child and his mother by night and withdrew to Egypt. There he stayed until the death of Herod. And this fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. That's, all right. Let's see what that's talking about. That references Hosea 11, 1 through 7. What is out of Egypt? When I was in when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt, I called my son. But the more I called Israel, the farther they departed from me. They sacrificed to the Baals and burned incense to carved images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them in my arms. But they never realized who I that I it was I who healed them. 
I led them with cords of kindness and ropes of love. I lifted the yoke from their necks and bent down to feed them. Will they not return to the land of Egypt to be ruled by Assyria because they refuse to repent? A sword will flash through their cities. It will destroy the bars of their gates and consume them in their own plans. My people are bent on turning from me. Though they call to the Most High, he will by no means exalt them. So, once again, we are not talking about Jesus. What Hosea is talking about here is real-time Hosea time. Now, you can make the argument for dual fulfillment of prophecy, but I don't. Right? Unless it specifically says that this thing is going to happen in the future and then that thing is fulfilled, I don't consider it having to be fulfilled. This was history. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and I called Egypt. Out of Egypt, I called my son. And then they went into disobedience. Well, that's an interesting thing to bring in on the, on the, the Messiah. So the flight to Egypt, when Herod saw that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was filled with rage, sending orders. He put to death all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, according to the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was spoken through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. And again, I'm about to hurt somebody's feelings because Jeremiah 31, 1 through 25. <clears throat> Jeremiah 31, 1 through 25. At that time, declares the Lord, I will be God, the God of all the families of Israel, and they will be my people. This is what the Lord says. The people who survived the sword found favor in the wilderness when Israel went to find rest. And the Lord appeared to us in the past, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving devotion. Again, I will build you, and you will be rebuilt, O virgin Israel. Again, you will take up your tambourines and go out in joyful dancing. Again, you will plant vineyards on the hills of Samaria. The farmers will plant and enjoy the fruit, and there will be a day when the watchmen will call out on the hills of Ephraim, Arise, let us go up to Zion, to the Lord our God. For this is what the Lord says, Sing with joy for Jacob, shout for the foremost of the nations. Make your praises heard and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth, including the blind and the lame, expectant mothers and women in labor. They will return as a great assembly. They will come with weeping, and by their supplication I will lead them. I will make them walk beside streams of waters on a level path where they will not stumble. For I am Israel's father, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear, O nations, the word of the Lord, and proclaim it in distant coastlands. The one who scattered Israel will gather them and keep them as a shepherd keeps his flock. For the Lord has redeemed, ransomed Jacob and redeemed him from the hand that overpowered him. They will come and shout for joy on the heights of Zion. They will be radiant over the bounty of the Lord, the grain, new wine and oil, and the young of the flocks and herds. Their life will be like a well-watered garden and never again will they languish. Then the maidens will rejoice with dancing, young men and old as well. I will return their mourning into joy and give them comfort and joy for their sorrow. I will fill the souls of the priests abundantly, and I will fill my people with my goodness, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. A voice is heard in Ramah, mourning and great weeping, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. And this is what the Lord says. Keep your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears. 
for the reward for your work will come, declares the Lord. Then your children will return from the land of the enemy. So there is hope for your future, declares the Lord, and your children will return to their own land. I have surely heard Ephraim's moaning. You, undi you disciplined me severely like an untrained calf. Restore me that I may return, for you are the Lord my God. After I returned, I repented, and after I was instructed, I struck my thigh in grief. I was ashamed and humiliated because I bore the disgrace of my youth. Is not Ephraim a precious son to me, a delightful child? Though I often speak against him, I still remember him. Therefore my heart yearns for him. I have great compassion for him, declares the Lord. Set up the road marks. Establish the signpost. Keep the highway in mind. The road you have traveled. Return, O virgin Israel. Return to these cities of yours. How long will you wander, O faithless daughter? For the Lord has created a new thing in the land. A woman will shelter a man. This is what the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, says. When I restore them from captivity, they will once again speak this word in the land of Judah and in its cities. May the Lord bless you, O righteous dwelling place, O holy mountain. And Judah and in all its cities will dwell together in the land, and farmers and those who move with the flocks. For I will refresh the weary soul and replenish all who are weak. Well, that's problematic because, once again, what are we dealing with? We are dealing with Jeremiah, and we did it, Jeremiah. You should check it out if you are unfamiliar with what's going on. Not to rehash it too much, but this is dealing with real time Jeremiah time. They are in the Babylonian exile and they are anticipating the return at this point. It is right on the edge of happening. They are about to be led through the wilderness back to Israel to once again take possession of the land. It happens. It's fulfilled. Poof, it is done. Now the roads aren't leveled, right? There's no path made straight. That's allegory. But the rest of it happens. All the rest of that happened. And so we have fulfillment of prophecy in real time, prophet time. That lends me to think that maybe it's not talking about another 14 generations down the road. But if you have to have a dual fulfillment, I guess you can read in here that maybe someday that will happen. But what did it say about this, right? This is the quote, a voice is heard in Ramah, mourning and great weeping. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. That's, they're in exile, right? They're in exile in Babylon. And the Lord tells them, keep your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears. For the reward for your work will come. Your children will return from the land of the enemy. The land of the enemy is a clue here, people. This is Babylon. This is the Babylonian exile. This is him talking specifically about returning from exile. It's not talking about well, y'all are still in possession of Judah, but you're occupied, which is what's happening in real time, Jesus time. And so that's no return from exile. That's not what's happening here. This is a misquote. And after Herod died, oh, <clears throat> and then I was like, you know, I've never had any independent confirmation about Herod killing the babies. And you know what? There is exactly one historical reference to it. It is contained in this book. It is the only one. This is the only record whatsoever of this act happening. Now, Herod was not in any way, shape, or form a decent human being. He was one of, probably, one of the worst people to ever walk the, the face of the earth. He killed a whole, like, he killed all the males, right? But it was adult males, not children. And it was, it was purely out of vanity as he was dying. Not because he was scared of being replaced, but because he was scared of being forgotten and not mourned. Because he was such a horrible person. So he took one person from each family and had them killed at his death so that people would mourn. He was not a good person. But we do not have a record of this act 
actually happening outside of here. That doesn't mean that it had to be. It does not mean that it could not have been lost to the antiquity of time. But we have several references to the other atrocities he committed. And we only have one to this one. And it is relevant to the story. It is only here in this book that we really deal with going to Egypt, right? And where is this book centered at? Let's look at the geography again. Do y'all remember where Matthew is? Right? This is the land of Israel that ain't got nothing to do with us. This was Mark. Mark founded Alexandria Church right here next to Cairo. Matthew is dealing with the southern neighbors down here in Cush. He came down and founded the churches in Ethiopia, which is right next to Egypt, which is an easy thing to, to play back into, right? Well, there was also, you know, come out of Egypt. That's, that's something that these people in this region will be familiar with the story of Moses, right? They will be familiar with coming out of Egypt. And so it's easy to deceive people out of context. But if you go back and read this, it does not. There's nothing we've, we've, we've gone through that literally says outside of the gospels, right, in the Old Testament, nothing that we've gone through says that Jesus had to come. Nothing even is dealing with end times. All of the prophecy that we saw so far dealing with the birth of Jesus has been fulfilled in real time. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up! He said, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those seeking the child's life are now dead. So Joseph got up and he took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he learned that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophets. He will be called a Nazarene. And I was like, you know what? It's a little bit weird that they don't have this highlighted. This is a prophecy directly dealing with Jesus, right? Jesus is specifically being told, we have a prophecy. He will be called the Nazarene, and there is not. I looked for a while. I tried. I went through several different commentaries by Christian people and I saw their apologies for it and I don't buy it I mean they're like well they mean in the spirit he is a Nazarene even though there is not a single prophecy reference that I could find if there is one by all means drop it down below I will investigate but as it stands right now I spent time trying to find the prophecy that said he had to be a Nazarene and it's not there there is no part of this that is required. That's a problem, right? Are we are we still dealing with infallible at this point? I don't think so. Right? We have well past the point of infallible, incontrovertible. We are now into the point of do we take it at face value as an account or not? Now, I do believe that these things happen. I do believe that there was prophecy attached to them. Let me make sure we are done in Luke. I think we are. Oh, yeah. We will talk about the presentation at another point. That will be the next step. The, the early childhood, that the little we have of it. We're taking this piece by piece. We're going back piece by piece. I will be digging into all of the prophecies dealing with this. I, we have talked about these for the greater part before we skip the psalms we will go back to the psalms that are relevant not all of them are we will talk about the context of the psalms when we get there it is very hard to hear that the thing you have known your whole life is incorrect it makes you question everything that you've ever known so it is a, a natural reaction to be adverse to new information of the sort that we are talking about here if anyone understands that, it is me. 
But I don't think I did anything too speculative, right? The parts that I speculated on, I was clear about. It's the crazy parts with angels maybe being aliens. The rest of it is here straight from the book. The prophecies that they quote dealing with this have nothing to do with what they are trying to portray it as. You can read prophecy into anything. People read prophecy into the Simpsons daily. That doesn't mean it's real. Right? It doesn't mean that they, Mike Judge, Mark Judge, whatever his name is, is sitting down, getting in a trance, and seeing the future and placing it into a comic. Predictive programming is a whole thing, too. And maybe they are planning these things and they put them in there. Or maybe it's just coincidence. Maybe it just so happens. But if you are looking for it, you can find it. Whatever you look for, you can find. If you're looking for racism everywhere, you will find racism everywhere. If you are looking for sexism everywhere, you will find sexism everywhere. And if you are looking for prophecy everywhere, you will find it everywhere. This prophecy is fairly cleanly defined. And if you go back and you read the prophets in context, you will see not only were they talking about real time, but they were, in fact, fulfilled. The things they talked about may not have been filled, right? Like, some of the allegory was a little bit over the top. And some of it, I believe, directly deals with end times that we still have not yet gotten to. I'm completely crazy for that part, right? I believe that there are an end times bottleneck situation. I don't believe it's God coming back on the throne to say you are evil, go to hell. I don't believe that. I don't believe this book tells us that. I believe I've shown that fairly well too. I really do hope you have held on from the beginning. I hope that you reached here with enough understanding of where I am coming from with this. Like the whole reason I did this exhaustive study is because today, we are showing that these prophecies do not align with what we have been taught, what I have been taught. I try to keep it personal because I was taught contrary to what it actually says. I was taught to take these things on faith as written in this other part. And yes, the words are there, but they don't mean the same thing. It doesn't mean when he says, behold, the virgin will give birth. Well, Isaiah was talking about this specific maiden will give birth to a child. And by the time he is old enough, this specific thing will happen, and it did. But when, when Jesus happened, what two, empire, what two kings? What two kings that you feared are gone? Are you talking about Nebuchadnezzar? Like way back 14 generations ago? I know. It doesn't make sense. And hopefully... I bring a little bit of enlightenment, not too much confusion, to some very difficult topics, right? This is a very difficult topic. This is <sighs> this is going to hurt some people's feelings. I never mean to hurt your feelings, but there is no other way to do this, right? To go through and read the book and see what the book actually says will blow your mind. If you've been following along, what have we seen, man? Like crazy stuff. And so... It's okay to take it with a little grain of salt. That does not mean that God is not real. That does not mean that God did not create things. It does not mean anything other than maybe, just maybe, nothing ever had to die for you to be forgiven from sin. That's the point of this channel. That's the point of this study. That is what God himself has directly given to me. Nobody and no thing had to die for you to be forgiven from sin. The only thing ever required to be sacrificed for your sin is your sin. You have to turn your sin over to God. If you say something like, Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you as a sinner, and I ask you to forgive my sins, I freely accept the grace that you freely extend, and I ask you to change my life, He will. He will write His law in your heart, and it is ridiculously simple. Love the Lord thy God with all of your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And if you do that, you keep the law. But there's a couple of addendums you can add to make it a little bit easier. Go forth, be fruitful, and multiply. Subdue the earth and be stewards thereof, and shed no blood of man. That's the only addendums that you ever need to add to the law. And if you do those things, you are done, done, son. 
You're good to go. God's got you. He will write it on your heart and he'll talk to you. Listen. If it makes a difference in your life, it will change everything about your life. To the crew, thanks for hanging out. I appreciate every single minute that you are here with me. I am praying for you every single day. Until next time, I love you. God loves you. You are perfect, whole, and complete just the way that you are. And this has been Pitt State. Peace.